Hi, this is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of January 14th, 2019. The weekly top three is a regular segment on the Michael Duke Show. I join Michael on the show each Tuesday morning from 6.20 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. The show broadcasts on Facebook Live and via streaming audio from the show's website weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, and SoundCloud pages, and on my website at bgkeithley.com. You can find past episodes of the Weekly Top 3 also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, Michael and I start the segment with a brief discussion of the accreditation issues at UAA's College of Education before turning to the top three. Once we do, the top three are these. First, our look at the Alaska budget over the next 10 years, why we are coming to believe taxes are inevitable, and why we favor flat taxes once we start down that road. Second, Journal of Commerce editor Andrew Jensen zeroes in on the broader consequences of HB 331 in a a recent editorial, and they aren't good. And third, in her preview of the session, Senate Finance Co-Chair Natasha Von Imhoff tells Alaskans how the Alaska Senate majority envisions using Alaskans' PFDs as sort of a forced pick, click, and give. And now, let's join Michael crazy i've just been reading some of these stories i don't know if you saw this uh, uaa program issue i'm wondering uh and because harold in the chat room is saying the uaf education system is is going to be fine the uaa one is problem again does this come back to that that whole issue of having a divided three-part university system and of having studying a full accreditation for the entire university i mean is this just one more example of duplication of effort well, it is duplication of effort. We've got we've got three education schools. We've got one down at UAS, which for East, which for some reason is supposed to be the the lead on uh, on education now. And then we've got one at UAA and one at UAF. We've got resources divided uh, across all three, uh, and it's just I'm, you know, we're just too small a state to really try to be supporting three uh, fully accredited. Uh, uh, public education or uh, higher education schools, and this is one of the consequences of it. Uh, we don't have enough resources at one place, and they sort of drop through the cracks. And kids are affected. If we right. had a single university, it would be a different a different ball game. Right, right. Well, and that's and that also, of course, means that they have a smaller sample, so that their data is not right and everything else. I mean, it's just crazy. Well, I mean, why are we doing this? I mean. <laughs> Just... Well, we're doing we're doing it, frankly, because that is the way we've built up the state over the last 20, 25 years. We have wanted to have, uh, you know, something at Fairbanks. We wanted to have a university at Anchorage and Southeast didn't want to be left out. So we have a university at South uh, University down in Juneau um, and we're trying to support all three. Uh, and <laughs> that we, we've just I mean, they've grown to the point. Uh, and our revenue base has has sort of declined to the point that we just can't do that anymore. So uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna say that maybe you'll take a crack at this sometime this morning. Uh, but um, you're gonna have plenty to talk about with your uh, top three, and I'm gonna make a prediction right now that your top three is not gonna make some people happy today. I'm just gonna throw <laughs> that out there. Just going to throw that out there that we may be unpopular by the time this whole thing is uh, is over this morning. Are you ready to? Uh, are you bracing for impact? Oh, I'm all re- I'm always ready for that. I mean, I <laughs> y- y- sometimes when you go through the numbers, the numbers don't land where everybody wants them to land. Wants them to land, and you right. just sort of have to face up to that fact and and deal with it. Sort of like you know when you want three universities and you want to fund three universities and you want to you know three have three have have three fully accredited, fully functional, you know, doing all things for all people, universities. You just can't have that. Right. Uh, And so we need to face up to that fact. Every week we get a chance to talk with uh, Brad Keithley from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets, uh, who 
uh, comes in to kind of delve down into some of the deeper topics regarding uh, it's kind of a nuts and bolts down in the weed session every week. Um, that's what Brad brings to the table. Uh, some deeper analysis, some common sense. Uh, it really is one of the things that I enjoy. I know some people think that that's a little wonkish, uh, but it just it is who we are. And Brad Keithley joins us this morning to discuss uh, his weekly top three. Uh, and I've already predicted, Brad, that this show will probably be unpopular today for a variety of reasons. But let's uh, let's get down into it. Let's talk about number one. Number one is going to be the heartburn uh, uh, starter for a lot of people. You have taken a look at the 10-year uh, plan, the latest one available, which is actually from the Walker administration. Let's talk about that and what your findings are and where we go from here. Well, every December 15th, at the same time that an administration uh, uh, submits a budget, uh, makes it publicly available and submits it to the legislature, the administration is also supposed to submit a 10-year plan, which looks at uh, looks forward at 10 years of revenues, uh, 10 years of spending, and sort of tells you where the where the budget is going. You need that uh, in order to evaluate before you make any changes in a given year. You need to know what the consequences are of that over the 10 years, and that's been a fairly good device that we've had that we've been using um, uh, since the since the Executive Budget Budget Act was uh, was adopted in the in the 1990s to to require that. Um, this year, the, the, the Dunleavy administration did not submit a 10 year plan. I, I can guess why. I mean, they were, they were dealing with enough issues to try to get the a proposed annual budget out. Uh, but they didn't submit a 10 year, uh, budget, but it's not that 10 year plan, but it's not that hard to do. Uh, what you need to do is look at revenues, which they did do. The Dunleavy administration did do in the, uh, fall resort revenue sources book. Uh, that they published, um, and you can take spending numbers from the Walker the, the Walker administration's last 10-year plan uh, and 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 use those. I mean, some people say, well, Dunleavy's going to start out lower. Yes, but that means he's going to have to make cuts to get there. So it's whether you take cuts in advance or you take cuts during the course of a year. It doesn't really make any difference. You can you can use those numbers, and the and the numbers when you when you do that. So I did that and put it together and put it out on our Facebook page, um, and the numbers are as as depressing as you possibly could think they are. Now remember that the last Walker proposed budget used $75 for oil and said he had a balanced budget, but the Dunleavy budget comes in and says, no, let's be realistic about this. Right. And they're, they're using oil prices that are significantly lower, $65 uh, and below. Um, and so when you, when you drop oil that much uh, and, and, and look at what the consequences are, it's pretty damn depressing. Uh, the, the budget deficit for, 2020 using traditional revenues, the traditional oil revenues, uh, plus the little bit of uh, of, of non-oil uh, taxes that we have traditionally, uh, and then you use the spending, uh, the starting point for spending. That shows for 2020, it shows a 2.5 billion dollar deficit that continues uh, all the way out the 10 years. In fact, a couple of years or three years, it goes above three billion dollars. The 10-year average. Uh, for the deficit, just starting from that basic funding, that, that basic point is like $2.8 billion per year, every year, uh, 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 year in and year out, based upon those revenues and that spending. You add in uh, uh, Ham and 50, you're, you add in some, some earnings from the permanent fund, uh, and what I did initially, because this is sort of what the Dunleavy plan did, uh, is I took SB 26, the 5% draw, five and a quarter down to 5% draw. Right. Uh, and then divided that 50-50 between uh, PFDs and uh, and government. And so that lifts that budget, reduces that deficit sum, and gets you down to a billion one uh, over the 10 years, averaged over the 10 years. But that's before you take into account uh, the need to refill the CBR. Uh, keep in mind that we that this generation started out seven years ago. We started out with the CBR of about $14 billion. We've taken $12 billion out of that. We have the CBR now of $2 billion. We have to refill that. 
because be, all of our all of our fiscal reserves are running on fumes or running on empty and this isn't the last time the state's going to go through an economic an economic trough like we've been through so you have to refill the CBR to have it ready for the next time we go through this and 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 refilling it sooner rather than later is important to make sure that you're ready for the uh, for the next economic trough if you put off refilling it then you got fumes left when you hit the when you hit the economic downturn again so we have to refill the CBR um, and there's a lot of different ways you can do it, but but one way is to say, okay, we're going to refill it over 15 years. That's about 750 million dollars a year uh, to get it back to where it was. Um, and and you add that in, and now the deficit goes from the deficit we need to cover goes from a billion two a year, which is already bad enough, back up to around two billion dollars. So now you got a two billion dollar deficit. This is looking forward 10 years. You got a two billion dollar deficit year in and year out uh, that you're confronting, that you're going to have to do something about. So I took a look at, at, at how we could start filling that. Right. Uh, because, I mean, the big push right now has been if we just could right-size government, if we could just cut it enough, if we could get back down to that sustainable level and, uh, and cut into it enough, uh, and Harold says the legislature has ignored any budget and has been on a spending spree for decades. You know, if we could, if we could get a grip on that, we could handle it. What say you? Well, two billion dollars, a two billion dollar deficit a year is forty percent uh of of ten year spending. Uh ten year spending uh in the Walker administration was five billion dollars. That's wrong. That's too high. But cutting two billion dollars of that is cutting forty percent out of the budget virtually immediately. Um, uh, because I mean, you're, you're, we're already in deficit. We're just going to go deeper in deficit the longer we put off the cutting. So 40, a 40% budget cut. This is a legislature and a state, uh, that has found it difficult to cut 10%, uh, from the budget, found it impossible. In fact, to cut 10%, uh, from the budget. And we're talking about a 40% immediate budget cut. I know people say, well, Dunleavy can come in there and do it. He can use uh, the, the line item veto power, and you can do all sorts of things. But we need to be realistic about this. And frankly, the political will in this state just doesn't exist to make those sorts of budget cuts. Now, we can make significant budget cuts. I mean, a billion dollars is still 20% of the budget. And frankly, if you look at what the solution is to this situation, a billion dollars is, is in spending cuts needs to needs to be part of that. Uh, because we can't raise revenues enough uh, uh, to close the gap, uh, just just that alone. And a billion dollars in in spending cuts is 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 going to need to be the target. But that's still 20% of of the of the forecasted spending over the next 10 years. And and we've taken we've taken out the easy stuff like a capital budget. Dunleavy's not proposing a, a big capital budget at all. He's proposing a capital budget. This sort of stays in the same range as as what the Walker administration does. So we're talking about 20% out of the operating budget. That is necessarily gonna gonna create big impacts in K through 12, uh, in in Medicaid, in the university system, all of which you and I have talked about that that theoretically you can come up with ways to do, but this but these last seven years have been a lesson in the fact there just isn't the political will. Uh, in this state to do it. And having a governor with a line item veto is going to assist in it, but the legislature can override line item vetoes. And I think where we're going to end up at the end of this session is the legislature saying, okay, you want those PFDs? We're not going to fund a full PFD uh, unless you restore some of this spending. And remember, a governor can't add spending back. He can only cut. So if at the end of the day, uh, uh, Governor Dunleavy wants to restore a full PFD and wants the legislature to vote for it, which they have to do in order to have a full PFD, uh, then there's going to be some horse trading going on on spending. And I, you know, the last seven years has been a lesson that we just don't have the political will to make the 40% cuts in the operating budget 
that's necessary to get this budget back in balance. Uh, I'm already seeing uh, some people shaking and wagging their heads saying, well, I mean, the political will is there. Obviously, we've elected Governor Dunleavy and we've sent some of these new fresh faces to Juno. Obviously, we're going to get it done because we have got God on our side and momentum and everything else. Uh, but you're saying that it's not just I mean, that, that not everybody is on board with the uh, of the the cut train, so to speak, to state government in the legislature. Yeah, you go you go through the the political will exists in the Matsu Valley. If the Matsu Valley was the only one voting on this, uh, then yeah, by gosh, we got it we got it covered because the Matsu the Matsu is on board with with taking spending down. But we don't have just Matsu. We have Fairbanks. We have we have Anchorage. We have the Kenai Peninsula. We have Southeast Alaska. We have other parts of the state. And when you go through the legislature, legislator by legislator, you don't get. Uh, uh, the the number of votes that you need uh, in order to uh, in order to cut spending. H- heck, I mean the Republicans in the House can't even get enough to get organized uh, uh, in the House. Uh, so so thinking that you've got yes we've got Governor Dunleavy, but thinking you've got a legislature that is on board with making these deep cuts is is just wishful thinking. Um, and 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 the problem, Michael, is. If we don't face up to this reality uh, and we get to the end of this legislature and, and all of a sudden we see that, well, they didn't make the cuts, so now we need new revenue, the knee-jerk reaction in this legislature uh, is going to be PFD cuts. You, you and I are going to talk about this at the, in, the, in the third segment, the third uh, uh, of the top three when we talk about Natasha von Imhoff's presentation last week. The knee-jerk reaction in this legislature is going to be PFD cuts. So we either need to be talking about other revenue sources uh, and dealing with that as we go through the legislature and and going through the merits and demerits of the various revenue sources, or if we stick our head in the stand like ostriches, say we're going to get these spending cuts, the spending cuts don't happen at the end, and and the legislature is sitting there going, well, what are we going to do? We're going to have to do PFD cuts again. Um, th- that's that's where we're going to end up. Well, so. Uh, as, we've, seen, we've seen this for seven years. Might as well bite the bullet, Brad, and tell us what you think the solution is going to be. Well, for those who've already seen this on the Facebook page or those who want to want to see the detail, you can go to the Facebook page. I, there are two revenue sources that I think uh, that we need to be evaluating. One is to increase the draw from the permanent fund. The legislature has set the permanent fund draw at 5%. The actual average realized uh, real rate of return uh, uh, over the over the life of the permanent fund, or or any period, frankly, you want to average is about six percent. So we could draw up to six percent off the permanent fund, uh, assuming the permanent fund continues to realize what it's done over its 40-year life. We could draw up to six percent off the permanent fund um, and not damage uh, the long-term uh, viability of the permanent fund. Not take money from from future generations. Every percentage. Every bit of percentage we go below six percent, we're actually leaving more money in the fund to future generations than we're drawing out for the for the current generation. So one one adjustment is to increase uh, the draw from the from the permanent fund closer to the long run, long run uh, real rate of return. And the other that gets you that'll get you about two hundred and thirty million dollars a year uh, toward your toward your two billion dollar uh, shortfall. The other one is, as we've talked about on the show before, and I'm sure we'll talk about in greater detail as we go through uh, this legislature, is a flat tax. Uh, a 2.6%, uh, a flat tax is just a, a percentage from every person's income uh, and from non-residents earning income uh, or receiving from income from Alaska-based sources, uh, the same percentage across the board so that everybody uh, feels it in the same, uh, in the same way. Um, and if you, and I, I ran the numbers, and if you use a 2.6% flat tax, you can raise about $725 million uh, that way. So those two revenue sources then combined with about a billion dollars, we're talking about a fifth of the budget. I mean, we're talking about a huge number here, but those two revenue sources combined with about a billion dollars a year in spending cuts gets us back into balance and gets the CBR uh, on its way to being refilled. It doesn't fully refill the CBR, but it gets us about two thirds of the way uh, to refilling the CBR right. over, over the over the 10 years. Right. Uh, and just to be clear, 
This is not something that Brad is advocating lightly. This is not something that uh, he and I have ever wanted. Uh, we, we keep talking about how this is not where we wanted to go. We've been talking about it for four years, about this is not where we would like it to go. But if they're going to continue to push, if they're going to continue to just frame the argument in that way, or if in this case they just refuse to cut early enough uh, or do deep enough cuts, there's only going to be one solution left on the table if the state is going to be uh, continuing to be uh, 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 fluid and uh, and uh, you know and is going to cash flow at all. That's the only way to do it, right, Brad? Final thought for you. Yeah, yeah. It's it's it's. I mean, people talk about oh well, we can take money out of the earn. We can you know drain the CBR completely, and we can take money out of the earnings reserve. Well, there's two two questions questions about that. One, why? Uh, because you know if oil prices aren't going to recover. Um, and new production is going to large, come largely from federal lands and, and isn't going to add significantly to federal to state revenue. Why are we doing it? We're just we're just setting ourselves on a track to continue to live off reserves as opposed to you know paying our own way. This generation paying its own way. And the second is if you go into the earnings reserve and start taking money out of the earnings reserve, it's a PFD cut. It's not a PFD cut to the current generation. But it's a PFD cut to future generations because the earnings reserve is part of the investment base that spins off earnings uh, in the future, both for PF, for, both for the PFD and government. So right. if you start taking money out of that earnings reserve, you're just re you're just reducing future earnings and reducing pu future PFD. And Harold's already uh, slinging some mud here. Brad keeps forgetting oil taxes. The state needs to stop giving away its oil resources and get the fair, equitable share of oil taxes. The other aspect Brad is ignoring are the billions of dollars in oil credits to oil. Uh, Brad is a big oil advocate. Do you have an oil contract? Who's the largest supporter of Alaskans for sustainable budgets? Conoco Phillips. Uh, <laughs> so that's the, uh, you know, that's that's the uh, that's the aspersions that are being cast at your feet at this point. So uh, I'll let you well, respond. I, I mean, oil taxes are 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 an entirely separate thing. Uh, oil taxes are determined by what we can tax. Uh, without pushing investment elsewhere. I mean, uh, we, we are an investment-driven state. If we don't have investment in the oil fields, we don't have production. If we don't have, uh, if we don't have sustained production, we don't have even the, the, the revenues that we're, getting, that we're getting now. It's not like a piggy bank. It's not like a fiscal reserve that you can say, well, let's go drain the oil companies a little bit by increasing taxes and take more money out of them uh, to, make, to make our lives better. Oil companies have, have, have opportunities elsewhere, have alternatives. Uh, and if we tax them too much, they take the investment and go elsewhere, and we go back into production decline like we were uh, leading up to uh, up to SB 21. So, you know, we we can that's a that's a different debate. We can have that debate about whether we're setting our taxes at the right level, but it's not something that you can say, oh, we need more money. Let's go grab more money right. from the oil companies, and, and all will be okay. You and I, but you and I have talked about that there is still some money on the table there. But, you know, I mean, that there still is some money on the table that we could take in that, but it, in no means could we fill a $2 billion gap with it. Yeah. So the, so the one place that, that, that could use some evaluation is what the effect of the change in the federal corporate income tax rate uh, does from 35 down to down to the low 20s. The historical uh, uh, perception was that the state would take so, could take so much, the federal government would take so much and leave so much uh, uh, remaining to the companies. Uh, with the change in the, in the federal corporate income tax rate, more is going to the companies, and some of that's bleeding back through to the state uh, through state taxes. The increased profitability on the oil company side is bleeding back through the state to the state through the state tax approach, but probably not as much as as could be. Uh, uh, to keep us competitive, so I there, there's a, there's a way there, there's something to evaluate to go in there, but we're not we're not talking about anywhere near uh, a two billion dollar uh, two billion dollar hole uh, uh, that can be filled by by increased oil taxes. I mean, it, it's one of those things you could do one time or two times, uh, but the oil companies will go all, all go away, and in ten years we'd be facing much lower revenues even than than what we've got projected here. So. Uh, we can't treat it as a piggy bank. It's got to be determined on its own, on its own bottom, on its own competitiveness. Uh, Larry says, uh, until the state pushes more value added to other resources, we'll always be in this position. You appear to be focused too much in the box uh, on your thinking. Um, and, and, and again, you know, we knew this is going to be an unpopular. You and I have talked about this in the past because we have talked about this position before. This is a very unpopular position. 
um, to try and take. The problem is, is is that I can see the handwriting on the wall. I can I can already see this, folks. And, and again, I'm not advocating for a sales tax or for a income tax or a flat tax, but I could see the handwriting on the wall uh, as to what these politicians are going to do. We're going to talk about that here in just a minute with Brad. But the I mean, the political will is not there. I mean, they can't even get a majority at this point uh, in the House. The Senate is already filled with people who want to take portions of your PFD. Do you really think that those people are interested in shrinking the size of government? I mean, th- there is no other choice at, th- at this point. Uh, uh, I mean, because what they're going to do is they're going to force it down. And when they do that, they're going to push instead a progressive income tax in the state of Alaska instead of a flat tax. So, I mean, you could call Brad an industry mole and all this other kind of stuff, but uh, I think what he's trying to do is give us the clearest picture possible of what is pragmatically feasible, not what is the best case scenario, because Brad and I have talked about the best case scenario. It just seems like nobody's listening to us. I mean, am I wrong, Brad? No, no, Michael. I mean, so we've 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 been we've been on this road for seven years, and people have talked about, oh, we ought to be cutting. Well, we didn't, uh, or oh, we ought to have value added products. Well, that <laughs> how do we get value added products? The state has to invest in it because no private industry wants to invest up here. Uh, we're a resource state. We're not a value added state. We, we're too far away from markets to serve a value added function. Um, and so and so nobody wants to wants to do that, and everybody you know say, says they want it. But they want the state to invest in it. Well, that just sinks us deeper in the hole. Now, we've, we've been on this road for seven years. Uh, if we'd started back in 2012 when I wrote the first article uh, about we're spending too much, we need to get it down. If we'd started on the road then, we might be in a different place now. But we didn't, and there it hasn't been the political will to do it. Continuing now with Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. And the hate has already begun to flow from the uh, chat room uh, already uh, where they have uh, – already thrown the the word the corporate shill phrase around and other things here brad and i were just talking about you know look this is not something what brad is suggesting this flat tax idea is not something that we uh, endorse necessarily uh it's not something we wanted he and i have been talking about this for almost five years now uh together he and i he he's been writing about it for years i've been talking about this for 15 years in the state of alaska you know saying that we have a spending problem and not a revenue problem and yet we continue to run down this path uh people act like this is something that uh that uh, you know brad wants or that i would want or endorse but uh, the you know being pragmatic and looking at what is going on there has been no interest in right-sizing government, and it doesn't look like that there's still going to be an interest in right-sizing government. And uh, and I think that's that's part of the problem. Brad, do you want to address it before we go on to number two here? Well, I think, Michael, one thing that people need to keep in mind is we've been, we, we've been in this situation for seven years. Uh, we've, we've been spending beyond uh, our revenue. We've been running deficits for seven years. We've used $20 billion in fiscal reserves uh, over the last seven years to paper over this problem, $20 billion uh, to, to paper over this problem. That's nearly $3 billion a year. The, 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 the situation we're in now is we've run through all the fiscal reserves. We've run through the SBR. We drained that. We've run through the constitutional budget reserve. That's now less than $2 billion. Uh, if we had a major uh, disaster, if the earthquake had been, had, had been more damaging, we'd be through that like, you know, like nobody's business. We're down to bare bones constitutional budget reserve. We have no other fiscal reserves remaining. We have to face reality. People say, oh, we can go to the earnings reserve account of the permanent fund. Well, that's just a tax on future Alaskans. That's just reducing the investment base in the permanent fund and reducing future earnings out of the out of the permanent fund. That's not a solution. That's just saying, okay, we, we still can't face up it, so we're going to tax future Alaskans uh, to help us get over this, get over this hump, the political reality, the political will, the reality is the political will doesn't exist to make the level of cuts we have to make. We're through all of the all of the fiscal reserves. We have to confront the reality we're in, and and part of that is we have to we have to come up with with additional revenues. The the legislature left left unguided is going to come up with PFD cuts, folks. That's exactly what they've done the last three years. 
governor did it the first year, but the legislature didn't override him. The legislature itself has done it the last two years. That's where they're going to go. Right. And if we, if we don't come up with an alternative, that's where they're going to continue to go. And they have been empowered now with even more power. That's actually your number two, talking about the after effects of the court's decisions, not only on the PFD taking, but on HB 331 as well. Exactly. Uh, Andrew Jensen wrote a great article, uh, a great editorial in the Alaska Journal of Commerce uh, last week. He posted it on Wednesday, if anybody hasn't seen it. The title of it is Court Cases Give Legislature Carte Blanche. And and, and the article really assesses, or the, uh, the op-ed really assesses two things. It assesses the Supreme Court's opinion uh, in the PFD case that uh, Senator Wilikowski brought challenging uh, the legislature's right in the appropriations process to cut the PFD. And then it also assesses the court's, the, the most recent decision in the HB 331 case. Uh, the HB 331 is where the legislature uh, authorized uh, the issuance of bonds uh, to, uh, uh, to, to be used to, to borrow money to pay off uh, certain oil producers or oil companies early uh, on, for oil tax credits. Uh, and then pass that cost on to future generations, future Alaskans, by uh, stretching out the the bond repayments. Um, and the court the court upheld uh, that a couple of weeks ago. And Andrew's reflecting on that. And basically, Andrew's I think entirely correct assumption is that we've given the legislature a huge amount of power uh, to sort of over. We, we used to say we had a strong governor. Frankly, now we have a strong legislature a huge amount of power in the appropriations process to sort of to sort of just ignore statutes um, and, uh, and to create things out of thin air uh, and to really set the state's uh, uh, fiscal agenda from the legislature as opposed to the way it used to be uh, viewed as being set by the governor. In the PFD case, uh, the, the court said, yeah, we don't care you've got a statute that says you're gonna do it a certain way. Each year in the appropriations process, the legislature can just override the statute uh, by saying we're only going to allocate so much uh, to the PFD and the rest uh, uh, and the rest we're going to spend in some other way, giving the legislature huge power in, in that regard. In the in the HB 331 case, which I think is 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 probably more important even than the PFD case, the Superior Court has said, and this is now going to the Supreme Court. But the Superior Court has said the legislature can end run the, the limitations in the Constitution on borrowing by just setting up these paper dummy corps, corporations and saying that, that the, the, the corporation, that, pa that paper corporation is going to issue the bonds and the corporation can say it's subject to appropriation because the only revenue the corporation is going to get is, is from the legislature. And we, we have a very elaborate provision in the Constitution that governs the issuance of bonds and basically, except in very limited situations, has, has historically been viewed as requiring that any bonds being issued go to the vote of the people, be approved by the people in a, in a general election uh, as opposed to, or a wide base election, as opposed to uh, just by the legislature. What the HB 331 process has done and what the HB 331 decision says is that the legislature basically can end run that whole uh, that whole provision in the Constitution, issue bonds on its own, and as long as they use the phrase "subject to appropriation" and set up a dummy corp, they can. The court said you can you can pass constitutional muster by doing it that way. Andrew's op-ed, Andrew Jensen's op-ed, does a wonderful job saying, "Well, what's to stop this now? When we now that we've done it for oil tax credits, why don't we just you know?" issue transportation, say we're going to issue transportation bonds, or we're going to issue public education bonds, or we're going to issue all sorts of other type of bonds, set up these paper dummy corps, um, and, and go ahead and issue, issue these bonds subject to appropriation, um, put the state's credit worthiness uh, at risk uh, by issuing these bonds, commit the state, commit state funding to these dummy corps to, to, to fund the bonds, and and essentially end run and end run the bonding requirements set up in the constitution. Right. If if for example we got to this session and the session said, well, we don't have enough money to pay for K through 12, but guess what we're going to do? We're going to set up a an education corporation, just like this oil credit corporation that we set up in HB 3, 331. We're going to set up this H this education corporation. We're going to go out and issue a bunch of bonds to get a bunch of money to borrow a bunch of money 
to pay K through 12 costs for the next couple of years up front, and then we'll worry about it in years after that, and we'll have these bonds, and you know, you, you know we're going to have increased oil production, or something's right. going to save us from all that. Essentially, it's, yeah, it's sen just, essentially violating the spirit of the Constitution while skirting the edge of constitutionality uh, in and of itself. Yep, exactly right. Yeah. And and I and that's the that's the road. I mean, you and I have talked about HB three thirty one a lot on this program. We'll continue to to talk a lot about it because I think it's a very very troublesome uh, thing that we did with HB three thirty one. If you don't like, if you, if you think all companies are getting too favorable a treatment, that's where they got right too, too yeah. favorable a treatment. Absolutely, Brad Keithley um, is our guest. Brad, I'm going to ask you to hold over here through the top because I definitely we need to talk about number three. Uh, Brad, I'm very very concerned about the. Um, the, the the ramifications of this because again in reading uh jensen's article and realizing it yeah all they have to do is set up a special dummy corporation for each thing that they want to borrow money on and all of a sudden they could borrow billions of dollars just utilizing that subject to appropriation language which of course works well until the first time that they don't appropriate money or they short pay it or whatever which of course is government's practice uh, occasionally and then that whole ho house of cards will come tumbling down meanwhile they'll build up billions of dollars in debt yeah exactly right and and you and and the cost of that debt i mean when you when you go through the when you go through the, the constitutional process you have the good faith and credit of the state behind those bonds right and you know and and, and borrowers know or lenders know that the state's going to pay those bonds the state's the state's going to back up those bonds the subject to appropriation bonds are, are two things. Uh, one, uh, their their end runs on the constitutional process. But two, if lenders look at those and and say, wait a second, you know, you guys really could cut me off, really not pay me uh, if you decide you don't want to. Well, then I'm I'm going to demand not not two percent interest, but I'm going to demand twelve percent interest uh, on those bonds uh, in order to compensate myself, protect myself against against your the potential that you're going to uh, uh, cut me off at some point. Right, Renee. And, and, and so the cost of our debt, not only are we can, is that a way of racking up additional debt uh, outside the constitutional process, but the cost of that debt uh, is going to be huge. And the more of those we issue, the more subject to appropriation we have out there, the higher the cost, uh, the cost is going to get. The, the people who frame the Constitution – knew what they were doing about debt issues. They knew what they were doing about bonding, um, and they were very careful, I think, uh, to create uh, some very significant sidebars, uh, uh, sidewalls on, on how the state could bond. HB 331 uh, just blows a hole in that, and the court's approval of it just blows a hole in that. That you know, I, I know it's Republicans that, that passed HB 331, but frankly, it's probably Democrats who are salivating at the use of it. Uh, down the road because it would be it's a way to increase state spending uh, and push the costs off on future generations uh, in 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 significant in significant volume. And of course, this doesn't mean that I mean, it might go to the Supreme Court. It may be overturned to the Supreme Court. But in the meanwhile, this gives them the time to think about what all the things that they want to do in this session. I think it, it, it even, you know, potentially gives them some pressure relief. Uh, on some of these things, which we're going to talk about here in a minute, because some of these people down there, as much as all the people you know that are in the chat room here, that are on Facebook, uh, you know, on a daily basis, uh, talking to all their friends about how we're finally going to get the cuts that we wanted with Dunleavy in there and everything else, that's all good. The political will is there, but <coughs> excuse me, it is not in the legislature. Yeah, absolutely not. Excuse me, frog in my throat. Uh, Brad Keithley is our guest, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Um, when we get back, holy cow! When we get back, we are going to be uh, we are going to be uh, digging down into the third of the weekly top three. Normally, I would have just we would have done two and let Brad go, but I think this third one is so mightily important, especially for you folks here in the chat room who are. Um, you know, who are throwing up lots of good arguments. Uh, I mean, I, I agree with a lot of your discussions and a lot of your talking points. 
Uh, Jim says, I say tough it out now. Make the 40% cuts now. I've worked in corporate situations where I was responsible for doing the same thing. Yes, it's difficult, but to save the company, it must be done with great care, not a butcher knife. Lots of details to look at, but do it. And, Jim, I think Brad and I would both agree with that. The problem is, is that you're not one person making the cuts. You have got this bastardized coalition of politicians who are not all pulling the boat in the same direction, right, Brad? Oh, exactly right. And you've got you've got the leadership. I mean, we'll talk about it in this upcoming segment. You've got the leadership on the Senate side that are already talking about PFD cuts. I mean, they're already they're already envisioning a situation in which we won't make these two billion dollars in cuts and uh, uh, and and tough it out. They're already you know pulling back from that and saying, well, we'll just use the PFD as a way of as a way of increasing funding, uh, funding to government. So it's, I, you know, I've been talking about this for, for, for seven years. I've been talking about this since 2012. If we'd started making the cuts, then we would be in a different spot, but we haven't. Sean Parnell didn't make them. Bill Walker didn't make them. The Republican Senate and, and when we had a Republican House, they didn't make them. The political will isn't there. And yeah, we're going to have a governor who's going to come up with a, with a budget that, that makes a big, big load of cuts but i but <laughs> i know you know the past seven years has demonstrated the legislature is not going to go along with that and they're going to go someplace else we need to be to be to be there thinking ahead of where they're going and get it at least to a better place than pfd cuts because uh, that's that's where we're otherwise going to go well, hour two of the michael duke show welcome back and good morning to you if you are just joining us, um, apologies again. I'm a little bit under the weather today, and uh, so I'm a little sniffly. And if you hear me coughing in the background, I apologize. Uh, we were discussing things with Brad Keithley, who's normally on only an hour one uh, of the show on Tuesdays. But what we've been talking about is so important. We only got through two of his weekly top three. We're down to the third one. Um, and this is uh, we knew was going to be a very contentious show because Brad is talking about the need at this point, because there is no political will in the legislature to make the cuts necessary. And uh, that if we do get to the point of having to discuss new revenues and taxes, that the the only thing that we need is the only thing that we should be discussing is uh, the flat tax versus everything else at this point. Uh, if that's where we end up going. And it looks like that that is where the political will is taking us with a lack thereof uh, of political will. And to back up that statement, we're going to bring Brad on to talk about his third point, which I think nicely backs up the statement that says there is no political will in the legislature to actually make these hard. Because there's a lot of people in the chat room who are who are saying, you know, hey, we don't need that. We just need to cut. We just need to cut. We just need to cut, which you and I both agree. The problem is you need 60 people to agree with that and that we can't even get 40 of them to agree on picking a leader between them. Um, so good luck on that right now, but you've got more evidence in that regard. So last Friday, Natasha von Imhoff, who is one of the co-chairs of Senate finance and, and frankly, uh, somebody who the Senate sort of trots out whenever uh, they want to talk about fiscal matters. Natasha made a presentation to, uh, a Friday, uh, regular Friday meeting of, or fr regular Friday session of the of a Commonwealth North um, subgroup, uh, and the title of the discussion was Budget Scenarios FY 2020. And the slide deck she used has been circulating um, uh, on the on the web uh, and is available for anybody to see. Uh, Michael, I think you said that you put up a link yep, to it. Yep, I put a link uh, up to it right now in the ch in the chat room. So this this is a very revealing. This is a Senate Finance co-chair a very revealing look uh, at, at, how, at what the Senate's thinking is. The Senate, the Republican Senate uh, thinking uh, as they go into the session. And basically, it comes through uh, the situation we're faced with, um, state reduction, uh, the potential for additional state reductions, how do you address the deficit, um, increase revenue through more oil, more oil production or new taxes, decrease operating expenses, pay a lower dividend, uh, is the third option they've got. They've got no other options on there in terms of revenue other than pay a lower dividend. Uh, and then they run through some of the budget uh, reductions that uh, 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 have been done in other states uh, where the current OMB director has been before, some of the ways uh, they get through it. But then in slide seven, uh, they, they, she gets to sort of the core 
uh, of, of how the Senate Republicans think about this. Um, and it says, how about the elephant in the room? And the elephant in the room, according to, according to this slide deck and according to her presentation, is the size of the permanent fund dividend. And then the next slide starts talking about how you could use the dividend, how you use the dividend uh, to, reduce the, uh, to reduce the deficit. And, and like the Walker administration did about the last year of their term, they're try she's trying to convert um, dividend reductions into specific spending items. So for example, uh, the first dot, and this is page eight of the slide deck for those of you who are either looking at it or will look at it later, the first uh, dot is a hundred dollar increase in the BSA for education. This isn't a decrease. She's saying a hundred dollar <laughs> BSA increase for education could be funded by a mere forty-two dollar decrease in the PFD. This is sort of like compulsory pick, click, pick, click, and give, right? Right. I mean, she's saying that we'll we decrease the the PFD by forty-two dollars, and that would help us fund a hundred dollar BSA increase for education. You got to understand. You got to remember that Natasha served on the Anchorage School Board uh, before she went to the Senate and was one of those who voted for ASD, Anchorage uh, School District, increases, uh, budget increases during her term there as opposed to fight for decreases. So first dot is $100, $100 BSA increase, $42 decrease in the PFD. Second dot is $100 decrease in the dividend is equal to about $60 million could all go towards crime and opioid rehab. So you can see the fashioning of an argument that let's reduce the dividend a little bit and we'll help pay for the safety uh, right. uh, items, right. safety related items that right. we need. Yeah, absolutely. It's all and about crime. The, We're not being taxed enough on the crime with all the crime stuff and the and monitors and alarms and everything else we're having to buy. We need more taxes for crime. Right. And then the third dot is a $500 decrease, decrease in the dividend would would give you would fund nine agencies, general fund budgets. It would it would help us meet, you know, keep uh, keep state spending. This is what the Alaska Senate is thinking. This is how they're approaching the issue. They're not there's not a whole lot of talk in here about, oh, we got to make two billion dollars in spending cuts. There's a little bit of that, a little tease of that. Uh, in the upfront slides, but when you get to the to the to the to the to the end of the the end of the story, to the basic slides that they're talking about, they're talking about using the PFD to fund, you know, what what decreases they could make in the PFD, what cuts they could make in the PFD to, to continue to fund uh, uh, fund government, and that's you know I I know people don't want to hear this, but that's where the Senate is. That's where the Senate's always been. These last seven years, it's been, yeah, we'll talk about spending. Yeah, we'll sort of talk about ramping down spending. Remember Charlie Huggins, when he was president of the Senate points, at one point said, over three years, we're going to cut it down to down to revenues. They didn't even come close to that. Two years ago, uh, 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 Senator Hoffman was talking about, oh, we're going to decrease it by another $500 million in the following year. In the following year, that was two years ago, in the following year, they increased spending. Uh, they didn't decrease it by another $500 million. This is what the Senate has done over the last seven years. This is what the Senate is going to continue to do uh, 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 this year. And if we don't have, if we don't talk about uh, better revenue measures than PFD cuts, which are the, according to ICER, have the largest adverse impact on the Alaska economy and are by far the worst uh, have the largest adverse impact on Alaska families. If we don't talk about alternative measures, this is where the Senate's going to go again. And the House, <coughs> the House can't even get organized. They're not going to act as a counterweight to this. And the Senate and Governor and people are going to say, "Well, Governor Dunleavy's going to do it." Well, no, he's not. He's going to try to do it, and he may even do uh, line item vetoes. But line item vetoes can be overridden. Right. And the and the governor's priorities also can be used as held hostage. Um, for example, restoring the PFD, it can be held hostage uh, by the Senate in negotiating for what they want. So right. And we've already we seen that realistic. Yeah, we've already seen the institutional uh, feeling of the Senate as a whole. I mean, barring people like Mike Shower and Shelley Hughes and maybe one other 
uh, most of these folks view the PFD as government money, that how dare we take it? That's their money that they need to be able to spend. It's not our money. And and that is the, you know, when you base your argument off of a flawed, a flawed foundation or a flawed premise, this is what you end up with. <clears throat> yeah, it's, it's not, I mean, I understand that people don't want to hear this. I understand that people want to continue to live in the bubble where, oh, all we need to do is cut our way out of this We that that theoretically we could have done that had we been at it the last seven years but we haven't and what's different this year why we've come to a head this year is we're out of fiscal reserves we've got no cushion anymore to sort of float our way through this year to year and say oh well we're going to get to it next year we've done we, we've drained them all so now we're down to either cutting the, the pfd this year or cutting it for future generations by drawing money from the ER from the earnings reserve account, or coming up with a much more fair and equitable way uh, to do to raise revenues. Brad Keithley is our guest, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. I'd ask him to stay over for one, <clears throat> excuse me, one final segment this morning because I thought it was very important for you folks to hear what he had to say. This is some of the most important and difficult things we've discussed with Brad here on this program, because again, it does not make people like listeners to this show happy. It does not make me happy to acknowledge that we, uh, you know, we want cuts, but we are the only ones. Those folks that are in power, those that have gone back, those that remain in places like the Senate, people like Von Imhoff, they have no interest in in actually cutting the size and scope of government. And as much as we weep and wail, gnash our teeth, rend our clothing, um, it's just, it's not going to be, it's not going to happen big enough and fast enough to make the differences that we need to do before we drain the reserves. And we need to be prepared. And I think that's all Brad is saying here. We need to be prepared for the inevitable when the, conver- the inevitable when the conversation shifts to revenue generation, because otherwise what they'll do is they will try and force an income tax or some kind of progressive tax down our throats instead, or they will just fully cut the PFD, which again disproportionately affects the lar- you know the largest eighty lower eighty percent of all income earners in the state of Alaska. Am I right, Brad? No, you're absolutely right, Michael. I mean, it, the the handwriting's on the wall. You look, Chris Birch made the statement last year uh, when when he was asked the question about PFD cuts. He said, "Well, it, the question was." Uh, uh, wouldn't you do something other than PFD cuts? And Chris said, no, I'll take PFDs down to zero before I'll do any sort of income tax. I, it is, they are going to take the PFD down to zero. And if people are fine with that, I mean, it, it, keep sticking your head in, in the sand and say, oh, we can do cuts, we can do cuts. And and that's just playing right into their hands because they'll say, oh, yeah, we can try cuts, but we couldn't get there. So now we need to cut the PFD in order to pay for it. You're just playing right into their hands. Uh, uh, when you when you when you go down that track, we need to be talking about better alternative uh, revenue measures than additional PFD cuts. Otherwise, that's where they're going. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Brad, down to less than about two minutes here. Can you just summate for me, you know, kind of your feels on the top three uh, this weekly top three and where we go from here today being the first day of the new legislative session? I think we've got a long and very difficult legislative session ahead of us. I think we're going to go into several special sessions, um, and I think there's going to be uh, big fights. I think the governor is going to come in with huge cuts, uh, and I think there's going to be a lot of lip service paying to, yeah, we're going to evaluate those and look at those. Aren't those good ideas? But I think at the end of the day, as the legislature finalizes its budgets, particularly in the Republican Senate, they're going to say, well, we just can't make those big cuts. Uh, We have drained the reserves. We need to do something else. And they're either going to look to the ERA, which are just future PFD cuts, or they're going to look to current PFD cuts. People who really want to be involved, really want to talk about, really want to contribute to this discussion need to have that scenario in mind. Uh, And they need to either find ways to get the Senate to actually make those cuts. Good luck. We've tried that the last seven years. But they either need to find ways to get the Senate actually to make those cuts or they need to be prepared about to talk about other alternative revenue measures. That's where we're going in this session. Uh, it's going to take a long time. We're going to talk about it a lot on this show, but that's where we're headed. And it doesn't mean, folks, that we stop the battle to cut the budget. That's not what Brad's saying. That's not what I'm saying. We need to uh, we need to keep that pressure on. We need to keep bringing. We need to remind him that people like Pete Kelly got kicked to the curb. 
we need to remind them of stuff like that, that if they want to remain in power, and quite honestly, I don't want any of these people to remain in power. Anybody with this kind of attitude needs to go. Uh, because obviously they really don't have a remember von Imhoff was the one that said well if we put all the, if we do this other stuff and we we increase these ta- all the moneyed people will leave the state of Alaska all the people with money will leave so apparently she wants all the people without money not in the top 20 percent to leave and she'd be okay with that uh, by affecting them with cuts on the PFD and other things so I mean we need to remember these things we need to think about it we need to be talking to our legislators this year more than ever and, uh, you know, love him or hate him, Brad Keithley has always got some thought-provoking stuff out there at Alaskans for sustainable budgets. Brad, I really appreciate you sticking along with me today. Thank you for coming on the program, and uh, hopefully we can, uh, we can gin up some uh, more responses on this. Michael, thanks as always for having me, and, and it's a discussion we need to have. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the Weekly Top 3 from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past us episodes on our YouTube and SoundCloud pages and keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3.